Hi, I'm Eric Bischoff, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Eric Bischoff, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here on the Sarah O'Connell Show today. You are a, a living legend in wrestling. You're one of the most iconic, influential people in the entire history of the sport and in, in, in entertainment. Uh, how are you today? I'm well. I'm uh, actually, if, if you could see outside... Um, We've got about eight or ten inches of snow. I live right outside of Yellowstone Park in a little town called Cody, Wyoming. And we had our first uh, heavy snowfall last night. So it looks like a winter wonderland outdoors. And I'm packing my bags, getting ready for about a 12-day trip to New York, Los Angeles, and Tampa. Uh, So I'm looking forward to it. Oh wow, so lots of different climates there. In England it's it's night time here at the moment, it's dark, it's slightly cold, no snow yet though. Well I've been to the UK many, many times and it's generally slightly dark and slightly cold. But I love the UK. I love coming back. I love the food and the people. So um, before we get started, I'd like to go uh, take you back to, I guess, 1991, uh, when you... Oh, you're going to take me back to 1991. I may need some help. I don't remember what I did yesterday. I'm not sure I can remember what I did in 1991, but I'll give it my best. Just make it up. Nobody will know. It will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> So you, um, when you first joined WCW in 1991, it was in, in an, you were an announcer. How on earth did you become president of the entire company? Well, it really, uh, a lot of very unique coincidences, number one. Number two, um, I've always been a very driven person. Um, I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. And I've always had a very big vision for myself, um, particularly when I was younger. I've, I've slowed down a lot now. But I think the combination of my personality and my passion for the business and the unique set of circumstances that I found myself in all kind of dovetailed together and created the opportunity. And so when when you first joined the company wcw was very much the underdog you know wwe or wwf as it was known at the time was very much you know it was the king of the mountain um and then in 1994 you signed hulk hogan who was at the time you know the biggest superstar in the industry and it was like a huge acquisition so was that do you think the first turning point in wcw's fortunes Again, you know, it's it's never one thing, in my opinion, um, whether it's the success of, of an enterprise or an effort or the failure. It's usually a combination of things. And in the case of WCW's expansion and growth and Hulk Hogan, it, you know, the first real step um, in, in our success, I believe, was moving our television production to the Disney MGM Studios, uh, because that did a couple things for us. It reestablished our brand in a much more commercial way, in a more visible way, because we were associated now with the Disney brand. And that changed the perception of who we were. Also, uh, very fundamentally, Hulk Hogan was actually producing another television show on the same soundstage or on the same lot as we were. The show was called Thunder in Paradise. And because of the proximity of WCW and us shooting wrestling and Hulk Hogan was already on the same lot, it enabled us to have some conversations. And I think because we were at the Disney MGM studios and Hulk Hogan saw what we were doing and in his mind, I think it changed the perception of who WCW was, I think those things facilitated the conversation and the interest in Hulk joining WCW and vice versa. And so, of course, up until that point, Hulk was was a good guy. How how did it come about? You know him. You know turning heel, as it called, and uh, going to the NWA. Um, was was he you know up for doing that straight away, or did it take a lot of persuasion? It, it took a lot of persuasion. I for, you know, when Hulk Hogan first came to WCW, and I think it was 94 is when he first came, um, he, was a, he was a good guy. He was the red and yellow 
vitamins, say your prayers, you know, kind of kind of character uh, for a couple of years while he was in WCW. And I think it, it was in early 1996, I, I visited Hulk's house and I tried to convince him to change his character and, and, and be a bad guy. And he didn't want any part of that at that time. Uh, he felt strongly that the Hulk Hogan character was too well established and he just didn't feel comfortable with making that change. So I went about my business and Hulk went about his business. He was doing a movie at, 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 around April or May. He was in California uh, producing a movie. And at that same time, I was laying out the groundwork for what was going to become the NWO. And Hulk saw that, you know, he was watching, even though he was in California and he was on a movie set, uh, Jimmy Hart was sending him tapes of the show every week so he could keep up with what we were doing. And I got a phone call from Hulk right around the first part of May. Okay. And he said, hey, Eric, you want to come out? I can't, he couldn't leave the movie set, but he said, could you come out to California? I'd like to talk to you about, you know, what you're doing and what I'm doing and all that. So I flew out to California, went to the movie set. It was out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we sat down and he said, so and this is what Hulk Hogan does. Puts his hand up. He starts stroking that Fu Manchu. So, brother, who's the third guy going to be? <laughs> I said, well, who do you think it should be, Hulk? It's got to be a heel. Got to be a bad guy. Hmm. I think that should be me. <laughs> so it took it took a while, but when he saw the MWO, and I think he got a sense that it was really going to be something special, and he knew that, quite honestly, um, no one could have made the MWO as big as it was other than Hulk Hogan. That's it, because I, I think, especially when uh, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash came in, it was a real game changer and made everyone pay attention because they didn't know, you know, what was real and what wasn't and were they invading from the WWE and all that kind of thing. And the the fact that then Hulk aligned himself with them, I, I think, you know, really sort of blew everyone's minds at the time and, you know, really got everybody talking. It, it really was a fascinating storyline, if I do say so myself, um, because it, it was the first time in, in professional wrestling that reality, you know, we took the, the reality of the business of the wrestling business and we wove that into a fictional storyline. And we did so in a way that it blurred the lines between what's scripted and what's real. And that confusion only enhance the interest in, in what we were doing with the audience because they, for the first time in a long time, they were what they were seeing on television, they would literally, they weren't sure, is this real? Is this not real? Are, is, this, is there a takeover? Are these guys really upset with each other? I mean, and, and I think that, I guess discomfort or just not being sure, you know, just drove people to tune in and talk about it. And, and that's what happened. You know, in the, in the television industry, they call it water cooler talk um, or buzz now, I guess, you know, with social media. But that's what we did. We created such an enormous buzz because we did something that had never been done before. And, you know, t professional wrestling has been around for a long, long time. And yeah. to be able to do something that has never been done before is a really difficult task. And we were able to do that, and it worked. That's it, because I, I think every week you weren't just creating television, you were creating these moments that people needed to talk about. You were, you know, stepping over lines and, you know, redefining what the boundaries are, you know. Before that, the companies never used to refer to each other at all, and there you were, you started, you know, breaking the fourth wall, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I think the effects of which is still being sort of felt and seen today. It, it, they really are, you know, and if, if you, when you talk about breaking the fourth wall and doing things that had never been done before, that was really my mission. When Ted Turner brought me into his office and said, okay, Eric, we're going to give you two hours every night to go head to head with WWE, WWF at the time, I, I was in a panic because I didn't know what to do. I didn't expect it. I didn't want it. 
Um, it wasn't my goal, uh, but I also knew I had to be successful. I had a gun to my head, so to speak. And I, I knew I couldn't be better at the WWE in terms of doing what they did because they had been around for three generations. And WWF has been around for a long time. WCW was a relatively new company, very small company compared to WWF. And I knew, since I knew I couldn't be better than them, I only had two other choices. I could either be different than them or I could be less than them. Well, I didn't want to be less. I was already less than them. So I thought, okay, I have no choice. I can't be better. I don't want to be less. So I have to be different. And I literally sat down with a sheet of paper by myself in a room for a couple hours. And I made a very basic list of all the different ways that I could be different than the WWF. And, you know, I don't remember the list exactly, you know, in order, but, you know, one of the, the, the obvious big things that jumped out at me at that time was that, number one, they had a very, I don't want to say childish because that sounds derisive, but they had a very animated, cartoonish type of presentation. Yeah. Whether their character was a garbage man or a dentist or a sailor or Popeye or <laughs> some other goofy, cartoony character. And, and they did that because, and it worked for them, by the way, but they did that because their audience was a predominantly children's audience. It was younger yeah. teens and preteen audience. So there was a reason they did it, and it worked for them, as I said. And I knew I couldn't be better than them at that. So what I did is I said, okay, well, I'm going to go after 18 to 34-year-olds. I'm going to go after an older, more sophisticated audience, which means my characters are going to have to be a little edgier. They're going to have to be more realistic. My storylines are going to have to be reality-based storylines as opposed to cartoon-based storylines. Um, that was like the very first things that I knew I had to do. Secondly, I knew that their show was taped. Right. Well, okay, well, that gives me an unfair advantage because if I can go live, I can do things and react in ways that they can't. So I thought, okay, so I'm going to go after an 18 to 34 year old audience, different audience. I'm going to use reality based characters, reality based storylines, and I'm going to go live. Those were the basic big things that I did differently. But yeah. if you go back and you look at the shows, and, it, and again, it's really hard to put it into context now because it's been 20 some odd years. Yeah. But one of the other things that I did that nobody else had ever done was I took the audience backstage. You know, up until that time, the only thing that the audience ever saw was the ring and the arena and maybe the set. Yeah. I, I broke the fifth wall and I took them backstage. I took them inside of a production truck. I took them into catering. You know, I took them in the locker rooms. I took them all around the arena. I took them outside. I took them in a parking lot. And I, I turned the entire venue and the property around the venue as my stage, which had never been done before. And it was another thing that led to the believability and the reality with the audience, because since they never saw it before, by default, they assumed, well, it must be true because I've never seen anybody do this. Exactly. That and like I said, it's, it wasn't any one thing, but it was just a combination of all of it. It's like a great recipe for your favorite meal. Right. You know, it's not just the flour. It's not just the sugar. It's not just the meat. It's not just the sauce. It's the combination and, and using the right combination of those ingredients to create something special. And, you know... Just looking on the roster too, you had people like Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero, you know, cruiserweights, which um, I think if I remember at the time, WWE didn't really have that, you know, it was all these, these monsters, these six foot eight people and not so much high flying a action, you know, they had technical wrestlers, but, you know, no Lucha Libre or anything like that. Yeah, that, and that was another, again, within the the mandate that I had of just trying to be different. Um, I had been traveling around the world. I spent a lot of time in Japan. I spent some time in Mexico. I had been getting exposed to the different styles of wrestling other than just the, the, the big man American style, which was so predominant at that time. And because again, I wanted to be different and I wanted my show to have a very international feel because the WWF didn't. 
WWF was very um, American, yeah. and very myopic presentation in a way when it comes to when it came to diversity. And I thought, okay, I want to be viewed as an international brand, not a American brand. So that's why I started bringing in, you know, a lot of Japanese. You know, to the WWF's credit, they had brought in Japanese in the past as well. But I wanted to make it a bigger deal. I wanted them to be almost a permanent part of WWE and not just a, you know, one-off or occasional kind of thing. And the same thing with the, the luchadors. I don't think anybody really, at, at the level that I was at, had exposed the luchadors to a national television audience. And I thought that was another way that we could make WCW feel like a worldwide brand as opposed to a, an American brand. Absolutely. And so when, when did you um, decide that you were going to, you know, start taking shots at WWE directly, you know, putting the women's championship in, in the trash and all that kind of stuff? Oh, right from the very beginning. Uh, and again, you know, I had the unfair advantage of, of being live and I had an even bigger unfair advantage of being owned by the network that aired my show. So if I needed to go up maybe five minutes early, you know, and be able to go on the air five minutes before the WWF did, I could give away all of their finishes. I could tell everybody what happened on the show because it was taped two weeks ago. Yeah. And I knew what the endings were. I knew exactly what happened on the show two weeks ago. So I could spend five minutes telling everybody what they don't need to watch and stay here because here on Nitro, we're live and it's happening now. It's not happening two weeks ago. You know, and, that, and again, you know, I, that was, you know, that was the first shot that I fired across the bow. And because it worked so well, I just continued to escalate that kind of attack. Yeah, I remember at the time it was so funny because, you know, it'd be said in such a monotonous, boring way too. Like this week on the show, that person beat that person. Anyway, on to our show today. And it was like, it was really funny. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun for me. It wasn't so much fun for Vince McMahon. Oh, I bet, yeah, he must have been pulling his hair out at the time, and, you know, speaking of which, you once, um, you issued an open invitation challenge to Vince McMahon to come on to, to Nitro and, you know, have a, have a fight, would you, what would you have done if he actually turned up, would you have had a fight with him? Of course. Really? Of course. I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 63 years old now, and that was quite a while ago, but, you know, I, I've been a professional kickboxer, I wrestled all through high school and college. I was a bouncer or a doorman in downtown Chicago for a lot, a long time. I grew up in Detroit. I've probably been in a thousand fights in my entire life, so getting into a fight was no nothing new for me. Um, and you know, win, lose, or draw it wouldn't have mattered to me. Um, the fact that if he would have shown up and we would have had that fight, it would have been a it would have been a hell of a moment. But, but it would have been like he, he decided he didn't want to face me. And he, he, he failed to show up, which is pretty gutless in my opinion. I don't know. I couldn't have done it. If he would have called me out, I would have had to go. I don't know how he could not show up, but whatever. And um, who do you think could have won? Did you hear that, Vince? I just rubbed your nose in it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's still going on. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, we're friends now. It's okay. We laugh about it. Who do I think would have won? At that time, I was sure I was going to win. But now that I know Vince McMahon, um, I'm not so sure about that. But like I said, I didn't really care one way or the other. I think ultimately just fans would have been the winners in that situation. Well, I would have been the winner because I would have produced the most talked about pay-per-view in the history of professional wrestling. And just like you and I are talking about the NWO, yeah. if Vince McMahon would have showed up and we would have had that fight, people would be talking about that for the next hundred years and so um looking back now as you say is it's been some time what would you say are your, your your proudest moments and fondest memories of working at wcw oh that's always a tough one for me you know as i reflect back i think just generally you know, when I took over WCW, it was a broken, battered division of Turner Broadcasting that, quite frankly, uh, even Ted Turner was about ready to pull the plug on. I was the last ditch. I was the last hope that WCW had. And for me, with no experience 
really in management, um, to be able to come in and not only save that company, but become the number one wrestling company in the world and in the process outperform Vince McMahon and the WWE. I'm not going to lie, that, that makes me feel good about myself. It was quite the accomplishment. Absolutely. It didn't last, you know, there was a lot of reasons for that, but to be able to, to reach that level of success, particularly in the short period of time that I did it in, um, is something I'll always be proud of. But when I think back, the things that actually put a smile on my face aren't the little things, you know, the little things that we did on camera that were fun. Uh, some of the interviews that we did. Um, performing, you know, for me was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and th those are the things that I probably look back at with the most fondness. And um, sort of, and is the reverse of that is that if you got any sort of re regret, of course it was a long time ago now, but if you got any sort of regrets looking back, is there anything you'd wish you'd done differently? Or are you kind of ultimately pleased with how everything played out? You know, I, I just don't allow myself to think that way. I mean, I don't live in the past. I honestly, I don't remember what I did yesterday. Uh, uh, for the Neither do part. I. <laughs> um, I just, I, I, I try to live in the moment in, in as much as I can. I know that sounds a little eccentric, I guess, in some ways, but I've learned as I've gotten older and hopefully a little wiser, um, if you live in the past, good or, you know, if you live in the past and you live in all the, the, the highlight reel of your career or in your personal life, you, you tend to get stuck there yeah. and you tend not to see the opportunities to create new experiences and new highlights in your present tense or maybe even in your future. So I, I just, I don't allow myself even in a positive way to look back and, you know, pat myself on the back or, you know, try to relive highlights of things that happened to me either personally or otherwise um and conversely i don't i don't spend a lot of time worrying about the future too much because there's so many things you don't have control over i try really hard to have a positive outlook today and to make today the most positive experience i can have to engage as many new opportunities or new people or new experiences as i can and i have a hard time doing that if i'm living five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 minutes ago, or I'm worried about what's going to happen next week or next month or next year. So I, I just, my brain just doesn't function that way. Yeah. My wife taught me, by the way. <laughs> I didn't come by that naturally. My wife taught me how to do that. Well, it's, it's great that you sort of, you know, you're still growing and learning and all that kind of thing. And I, I sort of approach things the same way. I kind of, you know, I learn from the past, but I'm I use sort of things I've learned and experiences I've had to, you know, perhaps inspire what I do next or to try and create new opportunities and really just make the most of the, the moment you're in now and get the best out of it. It's a good way to be. It really is. Because I, and, and, and again, I learned this the hard way. And one of the reasons that my wife taught me and, and worked as hard to teach me and change the way that I, I was in the past is because, you know, because I am a competitive person and I have a lot of energy and I'm an entrepreneur and those are all great things in some respects, but they can also create a lot of stress and anxiety and stress and anxiety can really, they sneak up on you almost like a, an insidious type of disease and you don't really realize how much you're letting your stress and your anxiety, which really is another way of saying fear, um, how you're letting your fears dictate your future. And once, you know, she'd tell me that over and over again and, you know, try to give me different examples of what I was doing and how I was doing it. And I was just like, ah, I don't want to hear it. You know, I was pretty stubborn. Yeah. But when you, when you really start thinking about it and realizing that it's true and subtly changing it, you can't just change. I couldn't anyway. I couldn't just change it overnight. It had to happen over an extended period of time. And then the more I changed, the more I realized just how much my drive and my passion and my anxiety and my stress were really holding me back because I, I wasn't my optimal person. I wasn't thinking as clearly. I wasn't as creative. I wasn't as fun to be around, quite frankly. Um, nobody wants to be around 
anybody that's so strung up and uptight and driving all the time. It's just like a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. So I chill a little more now. Good. Well, you know, you had an entire company on your shoulders and, you know, it was obviously, a, must have been a lot of pressure at the time and, you know, being that creative that often, you know, every single week coming up with new content and, you know, um, yeah, you, it must have been stressful, but it's, I guess it must be nice now to, you know, be able to take a step back from that and sort of appreciate it from what it was and, you know, but still be able to create new stuff that entertains people too. No doubt. No doubt. So let's um let's fast forward a little bit. Um, let's come out of the nineteen nineties and go to two thousand and two. Now, of course, I'm um, in WCW. There was loads of shocking scenes, but I think the one thing I personally never expected was for you to be announced the Raw General Manager. How did that come about, and what what was the atmosphere like when you actually got to WWE backstage? It was exciting for me. Um, it, you know, it happened very quickly. I never expected it either, quite honestly. But I got a phone call from Vince McMahon one afternoon, and uh, he was very gracious, very elegant. And I knew a minute or two minutes after we had been talking that I was probably going to end up going to work for him. And I was excited about that because I had, I had experience. I was very, I don't want to say angry, but I was very disappointed with how everything ended at WCW. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say bitter. I wasn't bitter, but in my mind, at least, I had I was done with wrestling. I had moved on. I created my own television production company with my partner, and we were having some pretty good success. And in my mind, I was you know wrestling was something I was completely done with, and and I wanted to be because it it didn't end in a very good way for me. And then when I got the call from Vince McMahon, I went, oh gosh, I'm going to go back into wrestling again. But the difference was that I was coming back as an on-camera character only. And I knew, and this is, your audience is going to think that I'm full of myself, but I knew I was a good character. I, yeah. I knew I was a good performer. And I knew that I was going to be working with other great performers on the world's biggest stage. And that excited me. And I, I was also very confident that my career in WWE was going to end on a very high note because I was confident in my own ability, but also because I was working with some of the best in the world. So I was very excited. And we kept it a secret, as everybody knows. Nobody knew I was coming in. And when I walked backstage for that first time and I saw the looks on people's faces, because no one expected it, nobody. And it was it was quite the experience, but it was, it was one that I... I I'm grateful for it. I'll cherish that as a memory. And, you know, the, we we got finally to see a match of uh, Vince versus Eric um, and lots of other scenarios we never thought we'd see as well. And you had quite a long run as well as general manager, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I had... It, like, it, it was a great time. I was there, you know, I was there much longer than I thought I was going to be. At. I really thought when I went to work there that I might last six months or a year. I didn't expect it to be a long-term relationship, quite honestly. Um, but I ended up being there for, I think, four or five years. I can't remember now. It all went by pretty quick. Yeah, I, I think, is it Teddy Longs is the only person that's been a general manager longer than you, I think? Yeah, Teddy's a good friend of mine. He's a great guy. I love Teddy Long. And so um, after WWE, you, of course, you, you went to TNA. What was your experience like working there? Oh, it was okay. You, you know, it, it, we'll just let it go with that. You know, the, the one highlight really for me working in TNA was the ability to work with my son. Um, that was a highlight that I'm grateful for. The rest of it, I try not to think about too much. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'll, I'll say this, by the way. So, um, 
I, I watched wrestling in the 80s, um, WWE. Um, in the UK, uh, there wasn't the internet, obviously, or anything like that. So um, I, we didn't have access to WCW. But then, you know, when people started moving over and uh, Hulk Hogan, it was actually on the news that he had joined WCW. It was that big of a deal. I started tuning in. And then I never watched TNA. But when, you know, when you appeared on that, I was like, okay, I need to watch this. So everywhere you go, it's sort of made me tune in. It's always must-watch television. Well, that's a compliment. Thank you very much. Genuinely. So, um, next, do you do you still watch WWE? What do you think of the the current product? I watch it occasionally. Um, I, I, I'll be honest. I can't sit down and watch three hours of anything. Um, news and current events, perhaps, depending on what's going on, but. Uh, to me, the WWE product is extremely successful, obviously, but it's it's very sanitized, in my opinion, which means absolutely nothing. It's a little bit overproduced, meaning it's so glossy and looks so perfect that it doesn't feel real. I don't feel tension when I watch it because it's overproduced. I feel like I'm watching scripted entertainment, which is great if you're going to watch a movie or a, or a dramatic series on television or an action film because you, you expect that. But when I watch wrestling, I like to believe that I'm watching a real conflict, even though I know, I'm, clearly I know it's not real. But, but I want to believe it is. Okay. <laughs> I want to I, I want to allow myself to believe for a moment or two that what I'm watching is real because that's how you lose yourself in, in, a, in, in anything that you're watching. If you're watching a sitcom, you're getting lost in the humor, in the acting, you know, the, of, in the performance. If you're watching a dramatic series, you're getting lost in the story, in the drama, in the passion with the actors, whether it's an antagonist or a protagonist, and, and, and you're following along and you're, you know, you go into it with your hands up, and then as the story gets better and the characters get better, you start leaning in with your chin, as they say in boxing, and you allow yourself to believe it. So for me, when I watch WWE, it's so overproduced and sterile that I just never get past this. Yeah. It's just, it, doesn't, and it doesn't allow me to engage the way I like to engage. That's not a criticism because clearly that formula is working for a lot of other people. But for me personally, eh, not so much. <laughs> so um, they've very recently announced that the, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, the next NXT pay-per-view is going to be War Games. How, how do you feel about um, this sort of classic match or idea being resurrected? And do you think... WWE might ever bring back WCW as a brand, and if they did, would that be something you'd be interested in too? Well, I, you know, War Games was uh, an idea, a creation by Dusty Rhodes when Dusty was in WCW. So I, I think it's a it's a great testimonial to Dusty. I wish it would have happened when Dusty was you know still alive, um, but nevertheless, I think it's a great testimony to the creativity of Dusty Rose. And for that reason alone, I'm very, very happy. I, I, I miss Dusty to this day. Um, in terms of WWE bringing back WCW, I don't think they will uh, because it's, number one, it's it's been gone now for about 20 years. It's been a long time. Yeah. The vast majority of their audience wasn't even alive when WCW was purchased by WWF. So I'm not sure that it will ever make sense for them business-wise. Although we see a lot of WCW on the network, and that, in a way, exposes it, WCW to an entirely new audience. Um, but I, I don't think they will. And if they did, uh, I think my on-camera days are over with. Um, you know, the, the audience is a much younger audience. They're... 14, 15, 18, 22 year old kids. I don't think they want to see a 63 year old relic running around the ring. So, uh, 
I don't see myself getting involved again. I mean, I, I genuinely think people would, of course, love to see you back. You know, another example is Paul Heyman. You know, he was best known for being in ECW in the 1990s but he's still going strong he's representing Brock Lesnar and they even did a resurgence of ECW in a, I think around 2005 ish so it'd be good to you see know him. it could happen but, but you know Paul Heyman is you know he's an exceptional Paul Heyman's never gone away Paul Heyman has been around he's he's never been away i've been away now for a long time i haven't been on camera for a long time i haven't been in wwe since 2005 or 2006 so i've been gone for all intents and purposes about a decade whereas paul Heyman is still you know he's still relevant he's still on camera on a regular basis so even though he's he's not as old as i am but he's close um he's in that same category i guess but the difference is that paul's you know He's right there next to Brock Lesnar all the time. You know, he's still relevant, whereas I'm not. And, and I'm okay with that. I've, I've got other things that I'm doing that I'm, I'm relevant in. But from an audience perspective, I think bringing me back would be, I, I think for a, for a one-time only type of an appearance or something as a special. Yeah. Sure, that would be. I'm sure the audience would, would like that. Some of them would. Um, but anything that would be ongoing on a regular basis, I think the audience would, ah, after a while. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I would still love to see that. So hopefully that will happen. Although, that said, you, you haven't quite been off our cameras all that time because you, you got to induct Diamond Dallas Page into the Hall of Fame earlier this year. What, what did that mean to you? Well, I was honored to be asked, quite frankly. Uh, it was a little bittersweet because... I knew that the, the reason that I got that phone call was because Dusty Rhodes had passed away. I, you know, I, I knew Dusty very, very well. Dusty was a good friend of mine. And, and so was Paige, obviously, Dallas. And I knew that in a perfect world, Dusty Rhodes would be inducting Dallas into the Hall of Fame. And I knew that, and so did Dallas. We talked about it. So it was, it was bittersweet, um, but... I was honored nonetheless and, and grateful for the opportunity. And so, um, of course, you're, you're a fan of wrestling as, as well, and you, you've worked in many great organizations. What do you consider to be the top three matches of all time from you know, any company? Wow. I couldn't pick. That, that's like someone asked me, what's the, what's the best, me what are the top three meals you've ever had in all the restaurants you've ever eaten in? That's my next um, question. I'm joking. I, <laughs> I really couldn't pick, honestly. I mean, there's been so many great matches over the years. And, and again, context is so important for a question like that because it depends, you know, in what way. Because, some, you know, I look back, you know, when I was younger, you know, some of the, the things that if I had to pick right now, if, if I had nothing to do but watch wrestling, you know, on DVDs or VHSs and go back and look at old stuff, what would I look at? I would probably go back and look at some Nick Bockwinkle, Kurt Hennig matches from the AWA. Because to me, and a lot of it had to do with my age at that time and the impression that that match, those series of matches had on me at that time, to me, they kind of, I don't want to make a crude analogy here on your show, but it's kind of like the first real love you've ever had. Yeah. There may be better ones after in a lot of different ways, but you never forget that first one <laughs> because it was the first one. And in the same kind of a way, when I saw, when I go back and I, I think about it, sometimes I'll see clips of them. You know, Nick Bockwinkel and a very, very young Kurt Hennig, to me, had some of the best matches. It, it, certainly in that in that era, but if I look at those matches in the context of the performance, the way they sold, the action, the believability, the emotion that they created in the ring, I still think to this day those are some of the best matches I've ever seen. Um, Shawn Michaels, you know, Kurt Angle, there's no doubt about it, you know, either one or both of those guys have had 
any number of phenomenal matches, but they're phenomenal in a different era and in a different way and in a different context. So that's why it's so hard for me to really judge. It just kind of depends on the context. Absolutely. Um, and then kind of related to that, who would you say are the top three wrestlers of all time? So, you know, you've got names that are always thrown about um, Rick, Flair, Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, John Cena. Who, who are your top three? Again, I would put Nick Bockwinkle probably right up there at the top. Um, certainly Ric Flair for, for a lot of reasons. And I would have to, you know, after that, it's a jump ball. Hulk Hogan, in my opinion, because of the impact that he had on the business. Not, not from a technical wrestler point of view, but as a character, Kind of hard to deny that as a character, Hulk Hogan probably had a bigger imprint on the wrestling world, the entire globe, than anybody. More so than Ric Flair. Possibly more so than Steve Austin. Um, again, different time, different era, different context. So it's not fair, really, to compare. But if I had to, I would, I would pick Nick Bockwinkel just for the sheer performance uh, an ability and believability. I would pick Ric Flair for some of those same reasons. And, and the fact that he's endured for as long as he has. Yeah. Because uh, he had the ability. Ric Flair made me look good. Okay. And I'm not a wrestler. Ric Flair could literally, there's a saying in the wrestling business, you could wrestle a broomstick and make the broomstick look good. That was Ric Flair. Ric Flair could wrestle a broom and the broom would look brilliant. Um, but Hulk Hogan, you know, I think it's hard to deny that anybody had, again, initially, that that huge impact that his character had on the wrestling business helped change the wrestling business around the world for everybody and really paved the way for Steve Austin and for The Rock and for John Cena and other people. Absolutely. And um, who do you think are the um, most exciting wrestlers today? Who do you think is going to be the next person in that category? Oh, you know, I like Sheamus a lot. A lot. Yeah. Um, I like, I like Dolph Ziggler. It's like, and every time I say that, people look at me and they go, what? I love but him. Yeah, he's great. I think he's underrated. I think he's underutilized. I, for whatever reason, he's, he's, he's just not high on the, the WWE ladder right now, and I, I just don't understand it because he's got a phenomenal look. He's versatile. He's an he's an incredible amateur wrestler. Um, he's an actor. He can be funny. He can be a bad guy. He can. He, he's so versatile that to me it's amazing that they're not doing more with him. I think Roman Reigns is going to finally find his stride at some point, or the writers who are writing for him will finally find their stride. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure who needs to hit their stride more. Um, I kind of think it's the writers and the people in creative more so than Roman Reigns. But I do believe eventually um, he'll, he'll, hit, he'll hit his stride and he'll be the guy that he should be. What, what do you think about um, the current trend of the, the crossover between mixed martial arts, MMA, and, and wrestling? You're starting to see a lot more, obviously, uh, Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lashley and CM Punk more recently, and then, you know, people from UFC turning up in WWE. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm very ambivalent about it. I, I You know, people have always tried to People have assumed that there was this big crossover between an MMA audience and a professional wrestling audience. And I think there is some crossover, but not really that much. Um, I, it, it's underwhelming for me personally. You know, I, I'll, I'll watch MMA from time to time and I'll watch wrestling from time to time, but I don't watch them for the same reason. Or do I believe for a split second that an MMA performer is going to be able to step into the rest, professional wrestling ring and have a great professional wrestling mess, just like with the exception of Brock Lesnar, there aren't very many people that are crossing over from professional wrestling and making any kind of a long-term imprint on MMA. Absolutely. Brock did. He had a very short career. And by the way, he got his ass kicked quite a few times too. Um, 
you know, he had kind of a glass chin. Uh, he, he, he won a couple, but he, he lost some big ones too. Um, CM Punk, uh, I don't think we'll ever hear about him in MMA again. I hope we don't for his sake. Um, so I, I think the crossover is a little – it's no different than the NFL. You know, you know, I use net professional American rules football league players. I use NFL players in, in WCW. So did Vince McMahon in the WWF. To that extent, I think there's a general crossover, but I don't think it's anything beyond that. Right. Um, can we can we do some word association? Just say a word or a few words that you, you think of when I when I say these names. Uh, so sure. the, the first one is Sting. Sting. Electric. Great guy. Ric Flair. An amazing encyclopedia of professional wrestling. Dusty Rhodes. The most underappreciated creative talent that's ever been in this business. Goldberg. Intense. <laughs> uh, Diamond Dallas Page. Talks way too much. <laughs> he's doing very well for himself at the moment with his yoga as well. Yeah, he's doing well. Yeah. Booker T. Brilliant. The ultimate warrior. Gone too soon. Very true. Lex Luger. A very uplifting and positive human being. It's been on a hell of a journey. Absolutely. Uh, the Undertaker. An enigma. One of a kind. John Cena. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Paul Heyman. My best friend. No, oh, wait a minute. Did you say Paul Heyman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you said Hulk Hogan. Oh, Hulk, Hulk Hogan. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If if Paul Heyman heard that I thought he was my best friend, you'd have a hell of a show on your hands. I know, right? I'm just going to use this clip. That's perfect. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Paul Heyman. Um, I've already used brilliant, but I think I may have to use it again in a different way. An amazing mind. Um, really, I know you're looking for one word of an association, but it's too hard with a guy like Paul. Paul has one of the most um, intricate understandings of the psychology needed for success in professional wrestling of anybody that I know. Um, Vince McMahon. A genius. Now, um, moving on slightly, so you are, you were a New York Times best-selling author um, with Controversy Creates Cash. Do you think you might ever write another book? Maybe not even about wrestling, about your, your other sides of the business, about television production or anything else? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think I have a book in me. I just haven't been that busy since I got out of professional wrestling. I don't have much to talk about. That's right. Well, you have been very busy because, you know, since, you know, the mid noughties, you've also been running a TV production company. You, you've got a brewing company and a podcast. What, what kind of stuff are you working on now? Um, well, I'm actually working on a, a feature film project right now, which I'm pretty excited about. Can't talk about it too much. A um, couple different television projects that I'm working on with some significant partners and, and large networks. Um, really the same thing that I've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. It's not new, it's just different. And um, looking back, what do you consider your legacy to be or what, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, that's always tough. <laughs> you know, I'd like to think that people will recognize that the changes that I made back in the mid nineties and the late nineties had a dramatic and a positive impact on what we know of today as professional wrestling or sports entertainment. Some of those changes that I made back in the mid nineties and late nineties are things that Vince McMahon is still doing today. Um, and hopefully people will recognize that, but I won't lose any sleep over it if they don't. 
<laughs> and then um, finally, have you got any uh, messages for your, your fans around the world and people watching the Sarah O'Connell show? Well, I've got two messages for them. Number one, I want you to watch the Sarah O'Connell show each and every week, religiously. Put it on your calendar. Put it in your iPhone. Make sure an alarm goes off so that you tune in to Sarah each and every week. That's number one. Number two, you know, enjoy professional wrestling for what it is. Don't overthink it. Don't overanalyze it. Just enjoy it and allow, allow it to be that escape where you can forget about school or you can forget about your work or challenges that you're facing in life in general. And just use professional wrestling for that one hour or two hours or in some cases three hours in a way to just escape and appreciate it for that. And I think you'll be a fan for a long, long time. That's fantastic. Um, Eric Bischoff, thank you so much for coming on the Sarah O'Connell Show. It's been an absolute honor to speak to you today. You are, of course, a complete wrestling legend. Thank you, Sarah. It's been a pleasure talking to you and, and being on your show. And next time I get to the UK, let's uh, get together and have a pint. I'd love that. That'd be fantastic. Um, and to everybody watching at home, uh, thank you very much for watching. Be sure to share, subscribe, give the video a big thumbs up. And I'll see you all again soon for another episode of The Sarah O'Connell Show. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.